Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Shirley Hoekstra. Have you ever heard the saying, God is not a Republican or a Democrat? What does that really mean? Well, today our guest is going to talk about issues of justice, human rights, caring for your neighbor as solid biblical principles that can be applied to politics broadly. Join us on Inner Compass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is Steve Munzma, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Pepperdine University and Senior Research Fellow at the Henry Institute for the Study of Christianity and Politics at Calvin College, and author of the book, Healing for a Broken World, Christian Perspectives on Public Policy. Welcome, Steve. It's good to be with you. I've enjoyed your book. Well, thank you. And you started as a state senator, and uh, you identified yourself, no doubt, as a Christian and worked with other Christians. How did that actually play out? Well, I think a lot of my support did come from uh, fellow believers, uh, from white evangelical-type churches, but from the Catholic community as well, and the African-American uh, community. And, Often, as an elected official, I would make connection with my constituents by way of some of these faith communities, and it worked out very well, actually. And how did your worldview play into the way in which you exercised the obligations of your office? Well, it largely impacted uh, how I thought about the various public policy issues that came uh, before us. Uh, I was on the uh, uh, the Environmental Affairs Committee of the uh, Senate, and I also was chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Social Services. And actually, I sought out both of those appointments really out of my Christian faith because I believe that God cares and we should care about His creation that He has made and given to us to take care of. And I believe he cares about those who are poor and who are, are needy. And so I felt, especially in those appointments, uh, I, I could allow my Christian faith, even though I won't always say it, make it explicit, but it was there undergirding almost everything that I did. You know, there's a stereotype that Christians are only interested in abortion rights or the homosexuality issue, mm -hmm. but actually uh, it's broadening out, isn't it? It is, and it's long overdue for it to be broadened out. I, I think that's very Im important. And, you know, even as a state senator, I was pro-life. It was very well known, and that's how I uh, voted. But that wasn't the beginning and the end of my concerns. It was only a part of who I was as a public official. Uh, and it's broadened out into both, you know, environmental issues, for example, and caring for young children in need after they were born, not just uh, before they are born. In Healing for a Broken World, your book, you talk about four biblical principles that are applied to some of the world mm -hmm. of politics. And, and one of those is the fact that, you know, we have a beautiful creation, uh, sin has affected that, but there's a redemption opportunity. And uh, what are the other three principles? Well, I also talk about justice or the common good as being the basic purpose of uh, government, that God has given government. It's, and therefore, our involvement, whether as office holders or as citizens and voters, should be to promote not our own personal good or even the good of Christians as, uh, as believers, but rather we should be concerned about the common good and justice for all persons, not just for ourselves. Also, there's the idea of solidarity, which is really, you know, loving your neighbor as yourself and standing in solidarity, especially with those who have certain special needs and, and seeking to use government or seeking to use what we can do as individuals or through our churches, through our families, through uh, other organizations uh, to help those who are in need. And then there's also, and this one is often missed, but the importance of civil society. There are a host of organization, in, organizations and institutions in between us as individuals and the government that often are, are, are ignored. There's the church, there's the family, there's uh, various nonprofit social uh, service agencies, there's sports leagues, on and on. And I think these also are part of God's intent for society and that whenever we see a need out there, I think we need to ask, what can I do as an individual? 
what can I do through my church or through nonprofit organizations? And only when those are inadequate should we turn to government. I think government has a real role to play as well. I don't mean to put that down, but it's not only a question of what can I do as an individual, and if that's inadequate, well, then we have to turn to government. There's also all these civil society organizations. In fact, you, uh, you make the point that if you are a Christian and if you are interested in your neighbor or justice or actually the running of a good and civil uh, society, that you should be involved that it's almost a mandate for Christian individuals uh, to be involved in their local agencies or their school, be on the school board or, or volunteer mm -hmm. for the zoning board or, or a soup kitchen. Yeah. Exactly. And it's not that God expects everyone to, to, you know, to look like everyone else, right. having all the same levels of involvement, that some stages in one's life or some individuals, the biggest calling may be one's own family to focus on that, especially when children are, are young. Because that can make for a good society if you have strong and able and well-adjusted children. E exactly. But at, perhaps at another stage of one's life or for another person, the calling may be more to l work uh, through one's church in its outreach to meet the needs that are in a community. Other persons may be called to be more politically involved. We must, you know, I, I think the politics side of it is also important. Uh, and I, I think not that everyone needs to be equally involved, but we certainly, as citizens and voters, everyone should be involved in the uh, public policy side of things to some degree. You talk about the proximity of a particular kind of issue because the needs are great. You look mm -hmm. around and you say, boy, I, I could be involved on this global AIDS walk or I could be involved with, um, you know, sustainability or environmental causes. But you have posited that proximity can help us decide how to be involved in certain things. Could you explain that a little bit? Sure. Especially the idea of solidarity can get very depressing. Yeah. If we are supposed to be concerned about all persons who are in some special need, well... This includes perhaps some of our own extended family members. It can be persons in our community. It can stretch halfway around the world to persons who are held in sexual slavery or who are HIV, AIDS uh, sufferers, on and on. And at some point, if you're supposed to be, respon be responsible and as a Christian respond to all of this, the temptation is just to throw up your hands in hopelessness and say, what can, what can I do? Right. So there is the idea of proximity and of division of labor. And I would think the closer a need or problem is to us, the greater our responsibility is. But at the same time, you need to stress that this proximity may not always be one of physical proximity. Oh, explain that a little bit. Um, well, you know, say someone comes to one's church or one sees a television program or w w which talk about, say, the HIV AIDS crisis uh, in Africa. Well, that's, you know, 5,000 miles away, but yet that AIDS orphan that has been drawn to your attention by a speaker or by a television program, a magazine article one has read, might be someone who has been brought into very close proximity in today's uh, world. And, and that you indeed might be called to, whether it's to contribute to a overseas uh, development agency that's dealing with the HIV AIDS pandemic in Africa, or whether it's to support uh, a public policy proposal in Congress for us as a society to do more. So it's not just a matter of physical proximity, but it's also to what you become aware of, that also needs to be stressed, I think. So it's keeping your eyes open, being alert to perhaps what is God bringing across your path and how can you, in a way, sacrificially perhaps extend yourself, not just from what you have extra, but perhaps what you're being called to do or prompted to do by this proximity yeah. Issue. Exactly. And, and, but there's the division of labor also. I don't think God expects every Christian from every background to be equally involved in, in the Everything. same issues. Yeah. Uh, and and he, I think here it, it's a matter of prayer and talking to uh, fellow believers and 
from some of those nudgings. One may feel called to be especially concerned maybe with poverty in one's own city or with racial discrimination in one's own community. Someone else may be called to be especially concerned about religious persecution in North Korea or in some other uh, countries, on and on. So the, I, I think that's why it's so important that all believers uh, 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 as believers are expected to be involved, not in the same issue, but be involved somewhere, somehow. This division of labor idea, for instance, um, if you're in the church, uh, mm -hmm. that's going to take care of uh, perhaps some faith-based initiatives. Uh, some churches run soup kitchens. Some churches run addiction counseling. Some do uh, marriage kind of support work. And if your school is working well, if you're involved with that, you're educating your children well, I think that after um, reading your book, you might be for smaller government and more local involvement that makes government less necessary if it were functioning properly. You know, sometimes when I was in public office in the legislature myself, uh, I would sit down and I would think, you know, if the rest of society was working, if families were doing what they should be doing, if neighborhoods were caring for each other, if churches were doing what they should be doing, you know, we could dispense with 90% of government because so often we seem to be dealing with problems that arose because other structures and institutions in society had, had failed. But of course, as I write in my book, this is a broken world in need right. of healing. Right. And we know that's, that's not a temporary state of affairs. Right. Uh, uh, because as Solzhenitsyn has uh, written, the, 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 there's sin in all of our hearts. There's a certain selfishness, and that gives birth to these various problems. So I think government's going to continue to be necessary. We need it. But I also feel it shouldn't be our first call. Uh, our first call should be to look at our own hearts and our own lives. What can I do? And then you broaden out from, uh, from there. But often the problems in our interdependent world, our interdependent society is such that we do need to call upon uh, government, even the national government. Well, I was thinking about how because of this self-interest that most human beings come to their world mm -hmm. with, that uh, issues like segregation, that was going to have to be addressed by government uh, way back mm -hmm. when that was mm -hmm. a, a uh, forefront issue because individuals did not want to bust their children or individuals did not want to change a perhaps comfortable way of life. And so government had to come in and say, mm -hmm. this is the better way to do it. Um, and then there are some issues, for instance, shoring up families in need that can be best done one-on-one. -on -one. We've seen that for instance, on a global scale with the AIDS work, when they had uh, you know, people going to AIDS, mm -hmm. individuals and family members saying, have you taken your medication? Are you eating well? That sort of one-on-one -on -one interaction, that was as successful as perhaps a, a global AIDS governmental project. So it's a both and on those kinds of things. Yeah, you know, I think some of the problems that we see in our own society right here in the U.S., is due to problems that start with the family, both in the sense of uh, births out of uh, wedlock, especially by teenagers, uh, by a very high divorce rate. And boy, what law do you pass to, to, to deal with problems like that? You know, thou shalt not have sex uh, before marriage. I mean, it, it's not going to work. No. Uh, what government can do, sometimes government policies can actually encourage the breakup of families. For example, at one point we had a welfare system that would provide funds for uh, a poverty family if there was only one parent in, in, in the family. Well, sometimes under those conditions, the best thing a, a father and husband could do would be to leave his wife and children because then they'd be qualified for what, what, what. Well, when there are government policies that are actually encouraging some of these uh, things, yeah, then we need to turn to government to change that. But for the most part, uh, uh, you really need to look to our families, our neighborhoods, the one-on-one -on -one help, our churches. I think our churches could do a better job. The sad fact is the divorce rate is about as high among church attenders as non-attenders. And there's something that the churches are missing when 
when that uh, when you see a statistics like that when you talk about being involved with people that's what we would hope would happen in a church setting where people would know each other well so if a family was breaking up or having difficulties people would be able to intervene in a kind and nurturing and helpful way but you know we know that with time uh, constraints everybody feels too busy too busy to to be involved in that way. And even in civil society, it's, we're too busy to really pay attention. How are we going to address this too busyness of our lives so that we're neglecting such important things? That, that, that's, that's a hard question uh, because this is a sin I commit. Sometimes I'm too busy. Uh, and, and just with the day-to-day -day pressures, I, sometimes I come home to my wife and say, look, I could have spent all day just answering emails and not done anything that I was intending to, uh, to get to. But the answer, even though it's a hard answer, it, it comes back to a certain sense of discipline where you set some time aside uh, and, and put, write it into your schedule. You know, if you say, look, I'm going to get involved in my neighborhood or in my community when I take care of my other responsibilities, you probably will never get there. I think the important thing is say, look, Thursday afternoons, I'm going to help with this ESL class or, or with after school tutoring uh, twice, uh, twice. You write it into your schedule and then lo and behold, you find you, you do have time for it. Some of these other things that seem so urgent somehow they don't seem quite as urgent. So I think that's the key. You, you talk about discipline and priority setting. So t much of our time can just in some ways be whittled away or uh, we talk about the tyranny of the urgent. So that mm -hmm. takes it away. But the principles that you've set down about justice and solidarity and uh, understanding that a civil society is going to take involvement does require a certain intentionality about life. It, it, it does. You know, sometimes I make a comparison with uh, getting the exercise that we should, you know, our doctors, right. we all know right. we, we right. should get a right amount of exercise, we should be walking or jogging or going to that health club, et, et cetera. And for so many of us, we, it, we never seem to get around to it. And again, the answer is intentionality, as you put it, right. uh, Shirley, you, where, where you write it into your schedule uh, I know one has to do this with one's, uh, one's family. I know when our children were young, and I, this was, they were young when I was in uh, politics, and at times I'd tell my staff, look, you know, Thursday uh, afternoon and evening, if anybody wants to see me, tell them that I'm scheduled. And the schedule was, it was family time. Right. And I think that's the sort of thing, e even those who may not be in public office or have some CEO of a corporation or so, but I think all of us need to, to follow that sort of a principle and set aside a time a, a, aside for those things which truly are important. Can government actually undercut these principles of, let's take, for example, civil society. Can the way government functions undercut that? Well, sometimes it can. And I think it's very important for uh, government through its public policies to come alongside these civil society institutions, not try to replace, re, replace them or undercut them. And it can do so once, sometimes by simply replacing them. Here, here, here's a drug addiction uh, program sponsored by a, a nonprofit. It's doing good work, and the government comes in with all their funds, set up a rival uh, a, a agency. Th th this is, you know, really reinventing the wheel. So how do we stop that? Well, I, I, I think, and, and we do this to a large degree. Here, so often we do get it right. I don't want to be over the negative, but often what the government can best do is come alongside some of these civil society, nonprofits, and, and help to fund them. And not over, try, try to take them over, tell them how they are to do it, but help with their funding so that they can double or triple the good work that they are uh, already doing. And is this part of the purpose of that faith-based initiative program? Yes, because some of these agencies that are doing good work are secular in nature, sure. others are re religious in nature. And I think there's a fundamental unfairness if our public policies would ever say, look, we're going to collect money through taxes from believers and non the religious and non-religious alike and send it only to non-religious uh, agencies. Right. Th that you, you immediately sense, hey, th there's something wrong here. That the money comes from all of us, and in a pluralistic society, it should then be shared with a variety of civil society agencies, 
both out of fairness and, frankly, a lot of faith-based groups are doing a good job, but many secular agencies are also doing a good job. And if they are, when they are doing a good job, I, I think that government should uh, financially support them, you know, under appropriate safeguards and standards and, and so forth. And in that way, you are uh, not undercutting them but strengthening civil society. So let's talk a little bit about civil society outside of our own borders, because we often hear about the United States using its aid function to influence governments uh, in other parts of the world. And mm -hmm. do you think that is effective? And uh, sometimes we read about, well, if you only want our, you, you get our aid if you only do an abstinence-based uh, sort of education policy. Or, uh, in fact, we've made some significant gains by uh, putting U.S. funds into AIDS work in Africa. Um, how does our government impact civil societies in other parts of the world? Well, we've learned from sad experience that most United States aid, that is government to government, often frankly is wasted. <laughs> you give it to the government that either through corruption or instead of going out to the people in the villages who really need it, it ends up in some Swiss bank account of some cronies of the, uh, of the uh, rulers in that country. What, and what has worked so much better, we're doing more and more of this, is that even the American aid would go to local nonprofit agencies that are indigenous in that other country, or they can be uh, American agencies, World Vision, Catholic Relief Services, et cetera, et cetera, who are often down there working on the village level, have contacts with uh, uh, various organizations on the grassroots in those communities, and funnel American aid through some of these uh, uh, international aid and relief agencies, not just because you want to go through them, but because they can get the job done better than either the U.S. government could or even the uh, local government could. Well, that actually follows your principles, which is there are these spheres, home, church, nonprofit, kinds of groups that are effective here in the United States, and they seem to be effective in other countries as well because they know people, or they yeah. know how the structures work, or they know who the influences are in a particular city or village. So again, the principles that you've sort of set up uh, nationally work globally as well. It is true, and this has been especially true when it comes to the HIV AIDS crisis in Africa, because there are antiretroviral uh, drugs which uh, really can extend the lives of those who are HIV positive, but you have to follow a very exact regimen. You, 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 you know, exact dosage, you cannot even miss a day, it has to be taken every day. Well, in order to make sure that is happening in some of the slums of large cities or in, in, in very small villages or far removed from the large cities, you need grassroots organizations, persons, you know, small health clinics, uh, churches, uh, other types of grassroots organizations, and that's where civil society come in, can do a better job than some large government uh, agency would be able to do. Now, a little trickier area is where governments outside the United States, and of course we know even within our own borders, but there are injustice issues. We know that there are human rights violations that happen in countries, and uh, one of these biblical principles is justice. How do we influence countries like that while staying in conversation with them, but saying, yeah. you know, is a compromise one that is going too far? Yeah, yeah. I, again, a very good question, Shirley, because I, I'm very clear in my book also, there are certain basic biblical Christian principles, which, you know, I'd stake my life on, okay. the concept of justice, solidarity, the importance of civil society. But in taking those broad principles and applying them in the real world, here and now, isn't so easy. Right. <laughs> and sometimes even two Christians equally committed to those basic principles might come up with somewhat different concrete answers. You take the issue of religious persecution. Right. Okay, in country X, how can we best deal with that? We, we cringe. There are fellow believers or believers in other faiths who are losing their lives, literally, because right. of their belief, this is an enormous injustice. But could you best do it by, you know, sort of by the, the stick approach and, you know, publicly condemning that other government, threatening to cut off economic aid, uh, you know, sending the Marines cruising around his border, you know, by threats? And, or 
could you better do it by trying to build bridges to that other country? Uh, uh, have some cultural exchanges of scholars or students and provide some aid, maybe try to engage more trade, encourage American businesses to, to invest in that country, and then gradually bring them a along and convince them that there's a better way to go. Well, there's no you know, one-size-fits-all situations. I think sometimes the stick may be better, other times the, you know, the honey may be better, the, the, the gradual, the soft power, sometimes a combination of the two, and it takes a great... And those are prudential judgments. Right. And, and you do, can't turn to the Bible or the tradition of Christian social teaching to find the exact answer. It, it takes care, it takes thought, it takes wisdom. It takes men and women of character. It, it, it does. And, and it takes believers and non-believers sometimes talking together, sharing their insights, uh, working together. And, and uh, usually, I, I think then progress can be made. It may come more slowly than we would like, uh, but, but yet I think that's, that's the way to go. Thank you. My guest today has been Steve Munzma, author of the book, Healing for a Broken World, Christian Perspectives on Public Policy. I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and thank you for watching Inner Compass.